think it must have happened towards the middle of his Leipzig years. I would say at around the time of his 50th birthday in 1735, which was the time when he put together a family genealogy, uh, which uh, made it possible for him to really look back into the 17th and even the 16th centuries. And it was also the time when his own children became actively involved in professional musical life. Several of Bach's sons carried on the family tradition. The most successful was Carl Philipp Emanuel, who served Frederick the Great of Prussia and distinguished himself as performer, composer, teacher, and author. Bach thought his eldest son, Wilhelm Friedemann, was the most talented. He was a superb organist, gifted composer, and prominent teacher. Christian, the youngest, was known as the London Bach. He served as music master to the Queen and was popular for his ten operas. Bach was really very proud of his family and of their achievements. Did he ever chide some of his younger sons with their fascination with new styles? No, I think on the contrary, he actually uh, felt uh, quite a bit in competition with them. And uh, he made adjustments in his style. If you take uh, the works from the 1740s, the Goldberg Variations, or the Peasant Cantata, or the Trio Sonata from the Musical Offering, he is really getting involved with the fashionable music of his day. <laughs> Creation to me is also a summation of all that his music stood for in its construction. In its construction and also in its virtuosity. Uh, the combination of the two elements, I mean compositional virtuosity and performing virtuosity. Of Bach's 20 children, only nine survived childhood. But the greatest blow to him was the death of a son named Johann Gottfried. This was a son that obviously Bach had been worried about from early in his life. I think his relationship with his whole family must have been a very loving and very happy one. And therefore, he was so heartbroken with this one son. And he made the mistake, probably, to send him early his life too soon when he wasn't ready for that. And then after that, he, he couldn't agree with his way of life and was heartbroken. It's probably the only really deeply personal letter that one knows of him. And that's why it's such a moving document. Upon my misguided son, Gottfried, I have not laid eyes since last year. At that time, I paid not only his board, but also his debts. And I left behind a few ducats to settle his bills in the hope that he would start a new way of life. But now I must hear again, with great dismay, that he has borrowed once more, and that he has not changed his ways at all. On the contrary, he has gone away and told me nothing of his whereabouts. What shall I do further? I must bear my cross in patience and leave my unruly son to God's mercy. And finally, Johann Gottfried turned up as a law student in Jena, only to die four months later. This was an enormous blow to the father. It was the first child that had died in adulthood, and he felt the sorrow of this very, very deeply. It may be that this was one of the reasons that Bach started at that time, at the age of 55, to set about putting his own house in order. He became aware of his own mortality, and he began to compile carefully his music, realizing that he was leaving a great legacy for the future. Bach 
Bach submitted part of the B minor mass to the Elector of Saxony in the hope of being appointed royal court composer. With profoundest devotion, I offer your majesty the accompanying insignificant example of my skill, begging that it may be received with your majesty's notorious generosity. I solicit your majesty's powerful protection. For some years past, I have exercised the directorium of music in the two principal churches in Leipzig, a situation in which I have constantly been exposed to undeserved affronts. Bach did get the post in 1736 at the age of 51, three years after he requested it. The Mass is a monument. I think it poses great problems of interpretation and probably one of the most difficult for me is the crucifixes. Because there you reach definitely the climax of the expressive. Uh, power of Bach, and yet it's so restrained. It's like if people at that time can't cry or sing anymore. It's all as if everything would stop because Christ is, Christ is crucified. And I find this extremely difficult to render. Very. Not to become too expressive, because then it becomes opera, you know. And yet to be moving without and the, the means are so incredibly simple, it's so exposed. The orchestra is like maybe drops of blood or tears or, you know, so uninvolved, you feel, as the orchestra is. And then you have the chorus, one voice at a time. It's incredibly difficult. It's like working with a microscope. I find that a great challenge, and I never was the, 100% satisfied, I'm each time less displeased, which is all I can ask. In the middle of the 18th century, King Frederick the Great of Prussia was busy being an enlightened despot, but even he had to have time to get away from it all, so he had built for him a summer palace. These are the glorious grounds of that palace, and behind me is the Sans Souci itself, appropriately named as Without Worry. It was in May of 1747 that he came here to inaugurate the palace. Part of his regular retinue was Carl Philipp Emanuel, the son of Johann Sebastian Bach. And the old Bach was very eager to visit his son and his new grandson. And had not had an opportunity because the relationship between Prussia and Leipzig was not very friendly at that time. But finally, in May of 1747, the old Bach came. And you can imagine the king's delight. The king said, Bach, I would like you to compose a piece on this tune and he played what we now call the royal theme. This simple theme triggered Bach's musical imagination to create a complex contrapuntal masterpiece. 